Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the webinar at Admiral Markets. My name is Chris, and Tarantula is with us as well. We together are going to take a look at how to understand the impact of central bank on forex market. Obviously, this is a quite a complex question. It is quite a deep question. So there are certainly many angles to it, and there are many factors and variables uh, that even economists are twisting and doubting about. So uh, this is a, not a uh, all one understanding a webinar that we right away have the magic formula, but we are going to take a look at you know, the key elements that, generally speaking, are, are known to be important and are uh, important for central banks and the forex market. So we'll be diving into the mechanics of that throughout this webinar. Uh, if you have any questions, by all means, please use the chat uh, to, to ask those questions. Good morning. Taradai and Justine, it's good to see you and everyone else. But before we start, though, please be aware of these disclaimers. The material here is intended for a global audience and may not be suitable for everyone. To find out more information on that and other details and conditions, please visit admiralmarketsglobal.com, select your country of residence, and contact an appropriate entity. Also, please be aware that trading for exchange and other financial markets is considered high risk and may not be suitable for everyone. Please seek the advice of an independent financial advisor for more information on that. This webinar is not advice and is for informational and educational purposes only. And by continuing watching this webinar, you agree with this disclaimer. Thank you so much for your attention. Once again, this is hosted by Admiral Markets, and Admiral Markets has an interesting deposit bonus available throughout March and April. Take a look at this link for available details and conditions. It's uh, with regard to your anyone's first initial deposit, and depends the percentage depends on the amount of deposit that is um, uh, that is added or or yeah added indeed for this month. So take a look. I'm sure that you uh, might find that interesting. So take a look at this link. Great. So we are going to take a look at the central bank. And of course, the central banks, they have a very, very prominent role. There are many actors and uh, participants in the forex market, tourists, uh, for instance, banks, commercial banks, uh, retail traders, hedge funds, uh, companies exporting and importing. But obviously, central bank is a big one because they're impacting the monetary policy. And it's the monetary policy that substantially, of course, pushes currencies into stronger or weaker roles. And then they move versus other currencies. And that's, of course, the currency pair. Now, in economics, we have also governments. They impact the fiscal policy. We won't be diving into that, but there are basically uh, two sides here that can be influenced by two parties, and they impact the country's or economic union or bloc, and they impact the, the progression of that economy. So monetary policy is basically headed or, or targeting uh, money supply and inflation, whereas fiscal policy is looking at expenditure of the, com of the country's budget and how they spend it, and uh, whether there's a deficit or surplus, etc. The central bank uh, usually has, on average, targets like this, a steady inflation and sometimes low unemployment rates. It does depend per central bank. You have, for instance, the Fed, the Federal Reserve, which is the central bank of the US, which targets both. But the European Central Bank actually only has a mandate to focus on the first one. It doesn't officially focus on the second, which is low unemployment rate. So it does vary around the world how that is, uh, what the targets officially are. But the idea basically is, of course, to optimize the economy so that, roughly speaking, as, as few people are unemployed as possible. Unemployment, of course, is un low unemployment is good because, first of all, uh, it's, it's good for the human capital, but obviously also uh, there's more taxes, more money coming in, less going out. 
uh, on average, and it's just, of course, good also for the consumption. So there are a lot of economic benefits. The steady inflation obviously is good because we have uh, the fa fact that deflation is not good. Uh, in general, this is the kind of the, the common kind of economics wisdom here that uh, spiraling down prices just has too many disadvantages. We'll go into all the details why that's a disadvantage be with different debate perhaps, but high inflation is is not good either because then you get kind of the spiral, a lot of control where prices are going up and up, and if it's too much, there's no stability in prices. Now, how do they basically they have to measure and uh, monitor and measure the economy to see if they're reaching their goals? Like all of us try to do, we have goals and then we try to measure that. The central bank is doing the same, and it looks at, luckily it has a lot of data points it can use, retail, producers, consumers, well we have of course the Forex economic agenda is full of news, and they too are looking at these news to, or this news to understand what's going on with the economy and to form a prediction and opinion about it. So they basically use that data to see if their policies are working or if they should adjust their policies. Now there is some problem with that data in the sense that how the data is collected is, uh, how is it uh, accurate? Because the data is somewhat lagging uh, and giving sometimes mixed signals. It's not, I would say, perfect information that they are working with. Uh, the data is lagging just because it takes time to collect everything. When we see an initial figure on the GDP or, or employment, often enough a month, two, three months from now, it, it is revised. Before these numbers kind of settle to their uh, kind of like closed version, the version that you know, is really the final number, it could take months, sometimes even a year or, or one and a half years before you really have the full picture in place. So that's sometimes difficult to make decisions about the future based on current numbers that are actually not as accurate as we would like to have it and actually we only have accurate numbers from the past, maybe six, twelve months from now, uh, ago, sorry. So we, but anyhow, the central bank members must take their judgment and interpret that average of data and project that forward, right? So that's basically their, their forecasting skills. And there are sometimes, of course, uh, by the way, um, agencies that look at the forecasting skills of central bank members and say how accurate they are. They look at their speeches, they look at what they say in, in the media, and then they look, you know, one, two years further down the line and see how accurate were those forecasts. And stuff like that is done uh, by agencies to see how, how accurate, you know, um, the, the central bank members are. And the one data or the one, you know, um, analysis that I saw actually showed that Yalen was one of the most accurate, or if not the most accurate, actually, in her forecasts um, just before she became the Fed president. So from that point of view, she definitely had the track record to back her candidacies. Candace, candidacy. So that's all, you know, being analyzed. The central bank is also dependent on the fiscal side because uh, if the economy is being pushed forward because of uh, for instance, more expenditures by the government that will impact that, that monetary side as well. For instance, what are the options here? Well, basically, fiscal monetary uh, decisions could impact the GDP. A decision, for instance, to increase sales tax could temporarily hike up the income of a country, but could hurt perhaps the economy in general. People could be spending less, could save more, and it could alter the, the structure of, of the current economy. Perhaps they will evade 
be more evasion of taxes, for instance, uh, or there will be more buying of products on the side, a black economy, for instance. So there are all kind of effects with policies that sometimes are known, sometimes are unknown, and this is, of course, something that analysts are continuously tracking and monitoring to see how various policy decisions have influence on, on the economy. And that's why you will see various theories about how countries should behave in certain situations to improve their economy. From a monetary point of view, the central bank looks at money supply and the quantitative of easing, for instance, which has been a popular topic in the last couple of uh, years, in fact, since the financial crisis or the Great Recession, as it's sometimes called, of 2008. And it looks at interest rates. Those are kind of its tools to influence and impact monetary policy to achieve its goals of a steady inflation and an optimal low unemployment rate. Now, ultimately, let me go back here for a second. Um, you know, basically what you see, of course, is a cycle. The economy usually goes through cycles of boom, consolidation, bust, and then a turnaround slowly but surely back up, and then a bullish kind of momentum to the upside again. And the monetary policy decisions go along with that business cycle, more or less, or they maybe even go in front of it. They kind of push that cycle. So when you have, for instance, the economy is not doing as well, the interest rates are going to be low to push the economy into higher gear. If the economy is overheating, the central bank is going to increase those interest rates to guard it from overinflation and try to cool off the economy. What we've seen more recently, actually, if the economy is doing uh, poorly, the central banks even decided to throw more money in the system to make the credit availability better and stimulate the economy not only by low interest rates, which have been already actually around for seven years, close to zero interest rates, but that was apparently not enough, and money supply was added to further stimulate the economy. All right, so that's basically that trend that you will see. Now, let's continue. This is basically kind of the what I wanted to share with you regarding these the central banks' policies, right? But how does that affect our forex trading in the forex market? What I personally use as a formula is risk to reward, similar like what uh, I talk about often enough in the trading webinars regarding okay how is the um, you know the risks uh, the reward to risk ratios of this particular trade setup that's what I then look at I think that the economy has a similar or the currency I should say has a similar kind of risk to reward uh, formula what I use is the value of a currency plus the chances of a default that's the risk side and the reward side is the interest rate this is not obviously something that impacts my trading, but impacts my estimation of how strong a currency could be in the intermediate to long-term future. What I mean with value of currency, first of all, is the GDP, the gross domestic product, that's the basically the size of the economy, measuring all kind of economic activities, by the way, um, and the money supply. The, the divided by the money supply. So you have, uh, let's say, a, a big economy, a big GDP number, and an X amount of money supply, right? Uh, but if that, if the money floating around, which is the money supply, is increased, but the economy stays the same, then the value of the currency is getting less because we have the same kind of economy, but more money floating around. So that currency is not as valuable. Does that make sense? Let me. That's something I want to check. Does that make sense? Maybe I should grab a, a, a drawing tool. Because this, I want to 
emphasize that everyone is on board on this formula. Um, all right, so let me uh, use my drawing tool here if if I can. Okay, I got two yeses. Okay, drawing tool is working. So, sorry about that delay, but so let's, this is GDP, this is the value, and we got uh, divided by money supply. All right, so if GDP goes up, but money supply stays the same, that means the currency is going to increase in value because there's more econo economic activity, but the money supply, supply is the same. So every unit of money is worth more. The opposite is true if the GDP is going down or staying the same, but the money supply is the same, the same, or going up. In that regard, the value of the currency is going down because there's less economy, right? The economy is shrinking, it's smaller, but there's more money floating around. So the value of that currency is going to go down. Let's make a real example. For instance, the, the euro. The euro GDP is going down, right? Or at least saying the same. We're not seeing much of a growth in the eurozone, right? So GDP, not good. But the money supply with the quantum easing is going up. So the euro, the value of the euro is decreasing. So Modris, for instance, comments is, is saying basically if indeed the money supply has increased a lot, the value of that currency is going to drop. And that could certainly harm savers, for instance. And that could be definitely a significant uh, disadvantage for those. So that is the risk side. The default risk is basically the chance that a, currency, a country would not be able to pay back its, uh, its payments, its debt. Greece, of course, is a logical example for today's current uh, events. But historically, there have been many countries throughout the ages and centuries, actually, that have eventually defaulted. Um, so that tends to happen. It doesn't happen every, every year, necessarily. But uh, if you look back at the last 400 years, it's something that does occasionally occur. It's just the country has too big of a debt, not enough income stream, and defaults. That default risk is not good if you're holding that currency, obviously. So you want to factor that in when making your analysis. And if the default risk is high, the value is going to go down as well. The reward side is pretty simple, I think. It's the interest rate. So if the interest rate is high, we get a lot of compensation as investors. And if the interest rate is low, we don't get much reward. So uh, if the reward is high, it's interesting. If the reward is low, it's not so interesting. All right? But there are two, two, two sides of that story. The, the, the ratio. If we got high risk and low reward, it's not interesting. But if we have low risk and medium reward, it could still be more interesting than a high reward and high risk setup. Right? It's the same like trading. Medium reward could still, or low reward could still be interesting if the risk is in proportion to it. So it's all about that ratio. We have to find uh, that, that balance. So not necessarily to be long-term investors ourselves or myself, but for me, just to judge how long-term investors and banks are thinking, to have an idea what basically uh, the, the currency could be doing. Right? We're talking about long, medium to long-term analysis here, to have an idea what the currency might be doing in the future. Let's see. Uh, i got one question. Uh, the GDP in the UK was poor, an increased deficit, but GDP is moving up against the dollar, which has a better GDP. How does this work then? Uh, yeah, it's. I think we have to consider the fact that there are various data points. Sometimes one data point is not going to be an, enough, kind of significant enough, to steer that particular currency right away into a certain direction. It's a, it's a mix of a, uh, data points and trends and events that accumulate to kind of the average, I would say. 
So more risk, less reward, basically, is bad for a currency, right? More risk, less reward. Bad, less demand for a currency. The op opposite, obviously, is true. If there's less risk, but more reward, it's good for a currency, and there'll be more demand for a currency um, in general. Right? We've seen a lot of demand for a dollar. There was less risk, relatively speaking. We're always talking about relative, because um, relative to other countries at this current moment, not relative to the past, it doesn't really matter, right? The dollar, the last year, relatively speaking, compared to a, a sizable group of other currencies, was posed, posed less risk and offered more reward in general, or more potential reward, I should say, which was good for the dollar and increased the demand for the dollar. Whatever the reason was, uh, whether it was uh, central banks from other countries buying dollars or whether there was just more um, a combination of uh, risk diversification from companies and, and, and other banks, but there was demand for that dollar. So the currency is relative to each other. Uh, so if we see, for instance, the dollar doing pretty good, uh, less offering less risk and more reward, we see demand for that. But perhaps another currency is doing even better. That's what I mean with relative. So if, for instance, uh, the Australian economy was doing uh, a lot better uh, and investors valued that more, then we would see the odd USD go up because although the dollar is doing pretty good, the Aussie would do, be, do even better. Uh, even though, for instance, the euro is, is pretty weak, perhaps there is even other currency that is even weaker and then still the euro would gain value because it's all about relative strength and weakness. So the euro would fall against most of it, but perhaps against one other currency not because that's even weaker. So this analysis is always a relative one uh, comparing one currency to another. But this is the general kind of idea that I use. So looking at some graphs that I made here, let's take a look at the interest rate so you have an idea uh, what the impact is on the euro dollar. What we see, for instance, and, and I know there are a lot of numbers here, but if you look from 1 to 9, you see, at, first of all, the date, 2000 up down to 2006. And the, the points here, 1 to 9, are also mentioned on the graph. Do you see that? So I have 1 uh, is here. Right here is 1, and 1 is here. That means that point 1, oh, you see nothing? Oh, sorry about that. Uh, let's see. Then you probably, it was frozen indeed, the formula slide. Now you probably missed with this one, but that's not so important. You already, it's clear, more risk, less reward, bad for currency, less demand for currency. I talked about that. Okay, good. Thanks for that. Uh, so one, is equal to 1. So this point on the graph here, the chart, you see that euro dollar chart here, 1 is 1, is the 10th of October. At that point, the euro had a 4.75% interest rate and the dollar 6.5. At that point, the dollar had a higher interest rate and the euro dollar was moving down, had moved down already quite a lot at that point. And uh, what we see why, there was an interest interest rate differential, a difference between the euro and dollar that was in favor of the dollar. The dollar was higher, basically. And as we go along point by point, you will see a shift in those interest rates and a corresponding point on the chart, how basically price reacted to that interest rate shift. And it's pretty spectacular how, um, how, how that goes, right? Then we see the, the dollar decreasing its interest rate due to the dot-com financial uh, problems that we had uh, back in 2000, 2001. The dollar going down from 6.5 to 1.75. Right, all one point two five even. Right, uh, this is supposed to be two thousand and two, not two thousand and twelve. By the way, sorry. So a, a, a drastic drop of five percent plus within uh, two years. The euro stayed quite stable actually for uh, another one and one and a half years, and then did eventually start to drop, but it dropped later than the dollar and less than the dollar. And we see that actually that causes this big euro dollar rebound up. So we saw a big uh, move up on that euro dollar 
uh, which corresponds with partly at least definitely can be explained by this interest rate, right? Then what do we see? Point seven, point six. Uh, we see again the euro dollar actually stopping at two percent, but point seven is pretty interesting because that's when the dollar starts to rise again. So and point eight and nine as well. So that's when we see the euro dollar consolidate. We see euro dollar move down a bit, but not as much. Interestingly enough, despite the fact that the dollar aggressively moves the interest rates up, we do see the euro dollar moving down. But considering the aggressive interest rate increase relatively on the smaller side. Then if we move on to the second part of the graph, we see again 10 to 17. But this is becoming a bit more more, more complicated because we see a lot of spikes up and down. And definitely here the impact of quantitative easing is coming into play. Right? Because 10, at point 10, the euro was already again higher than the dollar. And we see the euro dollar move up one more time very strongly. Now, uh, the Financial crisis at that point was starting, of course, and the dollar, the U.S. had already responded to that financial crisis by significantly lowering the interest rate quickly and hefty uh, or strongly. The euro did it a lot later and um, slower. So, but we do see at point 11 actually uh, price move down, and that could have been some uh, effect because of the the the, the global financial crisis, perhaps a flight to safety effect, kind of a psychological effect. Uh, the interest rate at that point was definitely so that the dollar was weaker. So it was not, could not be explained by a, a interest rate perspective, 0.11 I'm talking about, all right? But we have different kind of impacts and influences at that point in time. Point 12, we see, uh, we see then after point 11, by the way, the euro dollar go up again. That's because the quantitative easing was introduced in the U.S., so the dollars, with quantitative easing, the dollars are going to become less worth, uh, and the euro dollar went up again. Point 12 again, too, quantitative easing was again introduced, euro dollar goes up again. Right? Remember, quantitative easing is more money, currencies less, uh, valued less, that means in the case of the euro dollar, that the euro dollar will go up. <clears throat> point 13, we see the end of quantitative easing, too. We see euro dollar therefore move down again. Point fourteen, we see uh, basically quantitative easing three introduced. Right, euro dollar go up again, but very mildly. Point fifteen, we see the euro interest rate starting to decrease. Point sixteen, we see the end of quantitative easing, and point seventeen, we see quantitative easing of the eurozone. And we see, of course, as the U.S. ends its quantitative easing, and the euro drop its rate to near zero levels and introduce its own increase of quantitative easing, we see the euro dollar plummet. Uh, let's see, yeah, sorry about that. That's somehow it's not visible. Strange. Uh, let me do it this way otherwise. So that, of course, was that chain reaction here, the dollar ending quantitative easing and indicating a potential rate hike, the euro going the opposite way, and that was a big difference. And that's why we saw the euro dollar fall that much. A quick question here from Motorist interest rate, is money loaned to the commercial banks from central bank? Yes, indeed it's their, uh, the rate they ask. And uh, then central banks use that rate for their base, again, for their calculations towards uh, companies and, uh, and individuals for the next step. Alrighty. So here you can see those numbers in the table, basically. And every time it's orange, we see that the dollar is higher, has higher rates. Green, the euro has higher rates. And what you, I mean, this is not a lot of data, it's only one pair, but uh, what you can see from it basically is that the dollar seems to be, the U.S. seems to be moving its interest rates sooner, perhaps quicker, and is kind of leading the way. And the euro seems to be responding later, both in up and down. So you see the euro kind of responding later um, when there's a crisis hitting, and also increasing the rates later when things start to pick up again. So the cycle seems to be a tad kind of 
delayed after the US cycle. Um, in both interest rates and also, I would say, quantum easing. Now, all right, and here are the, the rates of, of late. You see the dollar was a lot higher, peaked at 2.5% plus in June 2006. And then with, within kind of a year and a half, the, the dollar and the, and the euro are equal to each other. And then quickly the dollar starts to, uh, to decrease. And a year later after that already, there is a 2.3% advantage for the euro. So within a two and a half year time frame, uh, the dollar goes from being up 2.5 to being down 2.3, a difference of 5%. Right? The euro basically stayed roughly equal with small up and down, but the dollar aggressively moving up and down. Right? But it's a small data set anyhow. So what does that mean? I'm running a bit of out of time. Sorry about that. But the, uh, try to wrap it up quickly. Regarding the future, what I think basically is uh, the fact that, you know, if you look at uh, the central banks at the moment, they're definitely in the news, they're very hot at the moment. There's a lot of things going on regarding central banks. They're not so much in the background as perhaps in the past. They're hitting the, uh, the front news, very front and center. And uh, well, there are a lot of things going on. There's the ECB introducing quantitative easing, the Bank of Japan too, the Bank of Canada, Swiss, the Swiss the Aussie, all lowering their interest rates, right? Um, so there is a lot of things going on. The New Zealand increasing it, one of the, one of the few central banks that did that. Uh, the U.S., of course, as well. So there are a lot of things that were in the news lately. So there is a lot of things um, going on, and they are definitely being mentioned a lot in, in the news. Regarding the future developments, I think that if you look at the, the Japanese currency, there's definitely going to be more pressure on the yen. Uh, regarding the quantitative easing, there's a lot of quantitative easing going on, and it, there are not a lot of good signals or signals in general that are showing that the quantitative easing is giving a sustainable, big positive impact as yet, at least. Right. So I think that the yen, therefore, will r remain under pressure. Uh, for the next uh, six to 12 months. And I think that uh, there will be no change of central bank course on that. So from that point of view, more weakening eventually in the long term, I think, is, is, is going to happen. The euro, well, it has weakened already a lot. Uh, but I do think some more weakening will happen, uh, perhaps a bit of a consolidation uh, for the moment. But ultimately, I think parity for the euro dollar will, is a realistic low. Uh, this year. It was my target forecast at the beginning of this year, and uh, considering that we already hit 104, whatever, 50 or 105, let's say, I think that I see no reason to change that for the moment. And there's plenty of time still to make one more dip to the downside. Considering the economic dimensions that are going on and dynamics, I, I don't think that that necessarily will change. The euro still remains under pressure. Um, Eurozone, and I don't see, there are some maybe some slight signs that the Eurozone is improving confidence, for instance, is going up after the central bank decision. But ultimately, the quantum easing is in play. So, for instance, with the Euro dollar, I think that if you look at the Fed and, and the chances that it will increase its rate are there, I think the Euro dollar when, uh, will, will have a, a decent chance. When? I think probably. Mm, we could see a month or two consolidation, so let's see May, June. Could could be in the summer, I, I would expect. I do think that there's a, a decent chance of a consolidation now. Still on the early side, whether this consolidation is going to happen now, but it's about time that eventually this consolidation is going to happen. I think that it could be now. Um, USA is rebounding, but there is data, a mix of data. So there's going to be probably some rate hike either this year, at the end of this year or beginning next year. But the rate hike seems to be limited at least in the next one or two years. Uh, eventually, I think that uh, you know we could see maybe a bigger consolidation uh, for maybe the next couple of years. In the very long term, though, when looking at even at the next decade, uh, I do think that we'll see probably, again, a growth spurt coming up. But this consolidation um, you know, could could last long, could last a decade, could last this entire decade and maybe see a continuation. But ultimately, uh, I think that the Fed will be able to, and the U.S. will be able to pull, pull itself out of this uh, recession 
um, and out of out of that uh, zone. Uh, the odd in New Zealand. Uh, well, that depends definitely on this China and resources, how, it, how gold does and, and stuff like that. But there could be some some downside pressure. It could be also a bit of a mix, some ups and downs, some consolidation, as it as basically data pulls it. Some data pulls it up, some data pulls it down. Uh, if China starts to worsen, that could have definitely bearish impact, obviously. Pound has some rate hike potential, I would say, and at the moment, I would say the Swiss is, is, is difficult for us to trade because of the potential of central bank intervention. It has done it three times, I think, already this decade, so I would be cautious with that one. Um, that's it from my side. Thanks so much. Consolidation basically is when the, your, when the currency pair goes sideways. Um, and, and doesn't have a trend. All right, let me pass it over to Tunena. Thank you so much. See you all soon. Thank you, Chris. A lovely presentation. Uh, so I will continue where I uh, left off. So basically, uh, we were talking about uh, central banks and their roles in forex market. Uh, I think that mostly central banks have uh, to control supply and demand in domestic and foreign currency and thus the impact on forex market is a very big. Uh, I wish you all a good evening, of course, uh, Justinas, uh, Law and uh, all other. And uh, yeah, you know that when we talk about central banks, we already know how the big impact is because we have been witnessing some of the greatest moves in forex market which were caused by uh, central banks. Well, first of all, central banks uh, have a, little, a big role in uh, buying currency. So they need to buy currency in order to maintain uh, monetary stability. Uh, central banks are known also as reserve banks. And they also, uh, instead of uh, buying and selling currency, they need to basically maintain the so-called equilibrium in the market. Interventions which uh, central banks do are basically they have in, in mind to to control the equilibrium or to move from equilibrium due to various reasons. We will see what those reasons are. Central banks they want to achieve financial stability of the currency. They want to battle inflation and basically when they battle inflation they maintain overall, overall economic growth. Okay, that is a very, very important point. Now, uh, the thing is, uh, when we talk about central banks, uh, we need to say that basically their, their, their role is also to promote the stability. They need to promote the stability by setting interest rates. Uh, skilled investors are able to identify which currency will experience uh, and increase, let's say, an interest rate based upon a central bank statement and incoming financial data. Those investors that are correct in their speculations can, are usually able to predict how the respective currency will move and the result should be able to take the proper uh, profit by t undertaking long or short positions. Central banks also do affect inflation on interest rates and, and investment. If inflation is of concern that the central bank will raise interest rates to slow the inflationary pressure. So remember that if the inflation is uh, of concern for a country, central bank will raise interest rates. Higher interest rates will cause inflation to slow because it will cost more for companies and consumers to borrow from banks to fund either investment spending or consumption. So that is when central banks increase, increase rates. Uh, increasing the rates is called rate hike. Usually when rate hike happens, that will strengthen the currency. Okay? The higher interest rates it will cause the currency to appreciate in the eyes of investors, both domestic and foreign, and they will benefit from a higher yield on the country assets. Okay? So that is when increasing of interest rates come. Okay? That usually 
promotes the stability of a domestic currency. Now, there is also a decrease in interest rates, and we have been inter uh, witnessing a decrease a lot of times. And uh, now, when, when central banks decrease interest rates, they basically uh, need to battle the deflation. Okay? Now, when we talk about supply and demand, that is a big thing also which uh, forex which central banks do. Uh, controlling supply and demand have the impact in forex market. Just like any commodity, the value of a free floating currency is always based on supply and demand. Now, if, if the central bank wants to increase a currency value, it will buy currency and hold it in its reserves. If they want to uh, decrease the currency value, central bank will sell its reserves back to the market. Okay? Selling back into the market increases the supply of the currency and it could lead to a decrease in valuation. Okay? De decreasing a currency value is a good thing, as I said, to fight deflation. Because deflation is also not good for the market because if, if the currency is too strong, it will cause deflation. If it's too weak, if it will cause inflation. So equilibrium should always, equilibrium should always, should always happen in a good and financial stable economy. Okay? Uh, uh, how does a central bank sell its currency? It, it's easy. <laughs> Basically, when central bank wants to sell the currency, it, it is selling it into interbank market, in the open market. And basically, they can sell, for example, uh, in our country, when a central bank wants to, uh, to improve the stability of our national value, they are basically selling euros, because euros is what our central bank intervention is usually, the, because our uh, domestic money is not valuable in interbank market. So we need here to sell euros to maintain the stability. Uh, think of it like this. For example, you are a forex trader, and you are selling, let's say, one lot of euro, right? And let's say euro dollar. And that is equal to 10, let's say 10, dollars, one, one lot. Uh, when central bank is selling, they are selling millions of euros in order to just move a little bit or strengthen or weaken the domestic currency. That is how central bank does. It sells currency in the open market. Okay? Now, the thing is, we also need to mention international trade flows. International trade flows also influence supply and demand for a currency. What is international trade flow? In, uh, international trade flow means when a country exports more than it imports, it's a called positive trade balance, then foreign buyers must exchange more of their currency for the currency of the exporting country. That increases the demand for the currency. It's called a positive trade balance. Negative trade balance means that the country imports more than exports. And basically, that decreases the demand for the currency. Okay? Now, banks do not have a total control. When I say a total control, I mean literally a total control. Usually, banks have a huge control in forex market, but do not have a total control over foreign exchange rates. Foreign exchange rates fluctuate according to as uh, actual monetary flow, budget, trade deficits, changes in GDP growth, and interest rates and other economic conditions. Now, when we trade, so in, tra in foreign exchange platforms, virtually everyone gets access to major news at the same time. Banks also have a, a do access, maybe slightly faster than we are, but usually those news are priced in. Banks have the upper hand from monitoring the trend and setting up the trend of the foreign exchange market. They are also monitoring the trend of their customers' order flow. Okay? So that is, that is 
how central banks impact the market, one of the reasons and one of the examples. So central banks also intervene on forex market. They are at the top of the food chain in forex market, but they do not have a total control. They do, however, form trends and by when we are, as I always say, when we are following big money, we are following the trend and then we can grab, grab some some uh, movement from the market and actually make a profit from it. Okay? I will talk about ECG and the Bank of England, Bank of Japan. So, uh, central banks usually can determine foreign exchange rates to a cer certain extent because they have huge foreign exchange reserves in hand, as I already talked, to stabilize the market. But you never forget that central banks are not the only players in forex market. There are speculative companies, speculative traders, hedge funds, pension funds, foreign investment fixing, uh, bureau de change, uh, other forex traders, retail forex traders. So basically, everything can impact the forex market. Uh, but banks, of course, do have the, the, the most impact on forex market. Uh, basically, uh, interventions when this is the good example of a nice, nice, uh, I can say some, this was a sort of intervention in Forex market when Janet, Janet, uh, Janet Yellen spoke uh, last time at Fed meeting, you remember this, this is the big move, Euro dollar went basically from the middle levels 1.06 to 1.10. Why that happened is because it says when flow hits the market there is no buffer. So it translates straight in big price moves. This was the big price move and this move was not caused by retail forex traders and other pension funds or hedge funds. This move was, was caused by basically by huge flow of the money. Flow means flow of the money in the market. Cash flow. Okay, cash flow. When there is a surge of a cash flow in the market of, of a currency, there is no buffer, so it will be usually a big price move. Surge was buying dollars, uh, sorry, this was selling dollars and buying euros. The money flow was so big that it caused an instant impact in forex market. Now, this move should not be considered as a trend. I have I have told you many times before, usually when there is a big spike in the market caused by a huge money flow, what happens is price retreats to the trend. So you can see that price retreated back in the trend, okay, just one day after the price surge into higher levels. Now this was one of the reasons why many traders were led to believe that the price will go bullish after this Janet Yellen statement. And you know we had a, our weekly Forex recap when I told you that you could buy Euro dollar at 1.0930 and what happened is basically the price went to that level 0 0.930 and then it surged a little bit higher then it dropped heavily. So this is one of the reasons why we should never take, most of the time, we should never take those uh, money flow spikes into a new trend, okay? Uh, yes, uh, London was offline, but the thing is, of course, because London was already offline, the bigger the move is, because there was less liquidity in the market, and when there is less liquidity, volatility can be higher. You, you are right. So, basically what, what happened is London set the move in a trend direction after the spike and now we can see that basically uh, as Chris said there is a period of consolidation now but the thing is this was not meant to be setting this was not meant to be a trend setter this was only big price move because there was no buffer and of course London was offline now central bank buys and sells foreign currency to control inflation maintain financial stability, maintain competitiveness in markets and 
in foreign exchange rates, adjust volatility, stabilize exchange rate, and very important to know is strong currency always hurts exporters. Okay? So investors are unwilling to make investment in foreign financial assets and firms are reluctant to engage in the international trades. The fluctuation of exchange rates will always spill into financial markets. Now, if the exchange rate volatility increases the risk of holding domestic assets, then price of those assets would also become more volatile. The stronger the currency is, more it, it's, it's ultimately worse for exporters. So basically, we uh, dollar definitely strong dollar is hurting the exporters. As low euro is definitely a good thing for Germany because Germany is the biggest exporter in the European Union. Okay. Now this is why interventions happen. I will use two examples of forex intervention. The first thing is well-known intervention in forex market after Japanese tsunami happened and that happened in 2011. Now we already said the central banks want to maintain control of their dom domestic monetary policy. They need in order to maintain the control they need to intervene in forex exchange market for an extended period period of time because market forces we already know that banks are not the only market force. They will quickly return the exchange rate to their currency supply demand equilibrium okay, after the intervention ends. So because of that, central banks need to continuously, continuously intervene in the foreign exchange market. Interventions are conducted to blunt large currency moves, which are caused by major events or market uncertainties, uncertainties that would normally have only a temporary effect on the exchange rate. Now, this is the example of Japanese earthquake and tsunami, and the Japanese yen had already been increasing its strength because it was feared that insurance companies would have to sell foreign assets to convert to yen to pay for damages. And that fear caused many traders involved in the yen carry trade to unwind their position, thus strengthening yen even more. We can see the whole yen basically strengthening here at this point. And when tsunami was uh, when tsunami hit the Japan, uh, Japan, basically it caused more of the strength for yen. Okay. Now, what happened is basically strong yen hurts Japanese exports. And then central banks of the G7 economies decided to intervene by selling yen to lower its exchange rate. Uh, normally, normally, when these kind of uh, uh, things happen, uh, as I already said, uh, investors were feared that insurance companies would have to sell foreign asset, assets to yen in order to pay for damages of tsunami. So it caused a further strengthening of yen. Now, what we saw basically, uh, constant yen strengthening, and after the yen was strengthened, we can see that forex intervention basically happened around these points. Now, the currency used to intervene in the exchange market is drawn either from the holdings of the Federal Reserve or from exchange stabilization fund, which consists mostly of euros and yen. Okay? New York Fed will sometimes act as a fiscal agent for other central banks and intervene in the exchange market on their behalf, using their own deposits that are held by the Federal Reserve. And that allows the central bank to conduct foreign exchange interventions that are outside of the normal business. So G7 countries, in contrary to Fed opinion after that, were basically buying also dollars to further weaken yen. And we can basically see that dollar yen is strengthening a lot. It's caused also by good uh, 
good fundamental numbers coming from USA, but also yen is very weak compared to dollar because they're also having their quantitative easy program and Bank of Japan is still weakening yen. Okay? So basically uh, we are talking about a constant intervention in forex market which was initially caused by huge strengthening of yen currency. Uh, you can also witness that dollar yen is so strong that when dollar is having a bad day, usually dollar yen is maintain some sort of stability. And we can see basically that uh, this is monthly chart. So in, in last six months, dollar yen has been very, very stable, holding up the upper hand in forex exchange market. The other thing is so well-known central uh, uh, Swiss National Bank intervention of uh, in forex market which basically happened in the year of 2011 and what caused the intervention was basically massive overvaluation of the Swiss franc which basically posed a big threat to the Swiss economy and it carried the risk of deflationary development. In order to subdue a potential deflation, they needed to weaken the currency. As I already said, weakening of currency is, is, uh, is, uh, is aiming to subdue the deflation. Okay? Increasing the strength of the currency is battling the in inflation. Both inflation and deflation are not good for the economy because they are two way from equilibrium. Okay? Now, Swiss National Bank is basically was aiming for a substantial and sustained weakening of the Swiss rank. They did it by undergoing a huge intervention in Forex market by buying Euros and selling Swisses. Basically, they didn't tolerate uh, euro Swiss exchange rate below the minimum at that time 1.20. Okay? And they were prepared to buy foreign currency, how they said, in unlimited quantities. So, the kind of, uh, that kind of floor peg was heavily speculated before the intervention kicked in, but exactly at this particular time, there was a strong intervention in forex market and you know it, uh, they maintained this peg until last year when they basically decided to unpack the currency and uh, now it's up to them how they will maintain the stability of their domestic currency but as I already suggested if you take a look at the dollar Swissy they're basically now buying dollars to sell Swisses and they, they want to, uh, by, by, by using dollars, now they're maintaining the, their stability in their domestic currency. So guys, I hope this answered a lot of your questions. Uh, we try to be uh, as concise as we could be and to give you the, the, the most important points how Forex central banks are influencing, how central banks are influencing Forex market. Okay, if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer. If you don't have any further questions, we can assume that the webinar is over. So just pay attention to our analysis and we will always say that if there is a possibility of central bank intervention, we will say that in our analysis. At the moment, we don't see any particular uh, intervention. Uh, you asked about uh, uh, hike in a uh, dollar and I think that Fed will go with hike in June or September but we will see there is a possibility in my opinion to happen in June but also if it doesn't happen in June it should happen in September so we will see but maybe maybe it has already been priced in the market so we will see but that is basically it's not an intervention usually that has a sudden impact on the market and market tends to stabilize itself after it. 
Bank of England, uh, we expected the hike maybe uh, these last couple of months, but there was no hike. So we should see uh, how the, the fundamentals will go in favor. Uh, I don't think that the high will happen soon concerning Bank of England statement, last statement. So I'm not sure that it will happen in the next couple of months. I'm not sure. Uh, because now at particular moment uh, there are no so good readings from CPI numbers and others. So I'm not sure that hike will happen anytime soon. But uh, be always ready. Be always ready to watch for their conference. And I, as, as you already know, I particularly don't uh, like to trade when there is a BOE conference happening. But when it happens, we will see. Well, Canada is definitely happy with the rate, obviously, as such as Australia. And uh, there were many talk about Australia rate uh, uh, cut, but it, it, it didn't happen. It hasn't happened yet. So, guys, we cannot speculate. When they decide to do, we, they will do it. But it's always best to wait for that, that kind of news and not speculate. Because speculation about hikes and trading just by speculation can definitely have a big impact to your account. Okay? Yes, uh, Yan, if B BOE sh pr would probably buy GBP if it drops to 1.42, because 1.42 is definitely a historically strong level to, to uh, uh, compare to dollar, but I'm not sure that Bank of England would intervene in a strong sense. Um, most of the time, you need to remember, guys, that uh, banks prefer uh, they prefer not to intervene. They prefer market intervention. So they prefer intervention from other traders, from retail traders, from pension funds, from other companies, more than they prefer to intervene by themselves. So usually banks are waiting for the market to put a price at equilibrium more than then they want to intervene by themselves. Okay? And I'm talking about strong interventions, not minor interventions, when when price is not moving about 100 pips per, per 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 single leg so basically they do not like to intervene they want first they want market to intervene by themselves by itself and then if market fails to put the price in a proper equilibrium which is con conducted by central bank economic policy then then they intervene heavily in forex market okay so uh, that is what we had for you today. Uh, we, I, we, I also wish you a good weekend, uh, in coming weekend. And guys, pay attention to next set of webinars, which, we, which will happen uh, during next week. And don't forget to sign up for live trading live with Chris and a weekly recap with me, because a weekly recap uh, will is always a good chance to make money with or without central bank intervention. We are here to help you. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you for comments. I wish you a very good week ahead. We will talk soon. Cheers.